Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Yulia Latin and Alexei Aristovich. Good evening, Alexei. Hello. Please, everybody who is listening to us, do not forget to subscribe to Alexei's channel, to our own channel, and of course to share links and to click the like button. That really helps. And the main question that I'll start with is probably going to be Avdivka, because as I understand, it's uh, only about 100 yards left for the Russian troops to reach that supply road. And I understand the road is already not used in this situation. There are no shells, no supplies in this regard. The last uh, one was sent by Germany a while ago, and then they used the critical stockpile, just the last reserve that they had, and there is nothing there anymore it's been depleted and there are no drones in uh, the demanded or required quantity and what i'm hearing is that in this situation the losses of both sides are either equal or ukrainian losses are exceeding russians and as they're saying as i hear from the front that russians are arming their aiming their uh, bombs their gliding bombs at the positions they're catching everything from wherever the smoke rises and trying to destroy whatever is left. Um, this is a very colorful description, Yulia. Looks like American action movie. On the front, it's not exactly like that. If that was the way they were hitting us, they indeed, they would have been already in the outskirts of Kiev and definitely would have taken Avdivka. They're still on the outskirts of Avdivka. It's just we're getting to the moment where the losses start to equalize. Initially, when it was 1 to 10, that's one story. 1 to 5 is a different one. And then finally we're getting to one to one, and that's a whole other equation. And the fact that it's equalizing now, this is what the correspondents, war correspondents from Ukraine are giving us the signs from uh, those locations. This is when defending the post becomes too burdensome, when we start losing more than uh, or equal to our enemy. This is when it becomes a trap. This is when we should regroup. When did we warn about that situation? early in September, right. What will our command do? We don't know. It uh, appears that we might be defending Avdiivka heroically till the very bitter end, unfortunately, right. So we'll see what our general command will be doing. I'm skeptical from September. Why? Because I know how we defended Bakhmut, Solidar, Lysychansk, Severodonetsk and Papasnaya. Not a single time out of five, actually six of those operations, not a single time our troops withdrew on time. It would be very strange when it happens this time. Those who can learn would probably do it. We unfortunately usually um, are not too good at lessons learned. Often political reasons dominate the war, the logic of war, the logic of military. Generally, politicians should be determining the way the, the war goes, but sometimes generals should have a voice when situation is not effective and they need to have enough power to convince politicians to follow them in those situations. But when we're talking about generals prevailing over politicians in Ukraine, we know how that works. It usually doesn't, right? It usually works the other way here. All right, I have another question then. General Zaluzhny said many times that he will not be holding on to Avdiivka. I'm paraphrasing here, but the message was that we should not be holding the position when it doesn't provide any military benefits, when it's only political benefits. And we have heard different story from Zelensky, who even called for his troops to go into offensive. Right now, it appears that Avdiivka will be given up, and after that, Zelensky will remove Zaluzhny and then the whole general command. Well, there are rumors and whispers in Ukraine circulating for about a month that uh, Zaluzhny would probably be removed after some event that could be used as a cause, as a cover for that. Avdiivka is the first thing that comes to mind. But in my view, the main problem of removing commander-in-chief is not fall and rise of cities, uh, capture and leaving the territories. It matters who will take his place. Zelensky in peace times usually has uh, about 167 general positions. In war times he can probably uh, set or remove up to 300 generals. He can do it with his order. 
The problem becomes who is appointed after. And this is the main question. If he had uh, somebody to put in that place, and not just one person, but the whole team or cohort, then definitely he would be removed a long time ago. Otherwise, we have a um, uh, political sort of undercarpet struggle who will be the next commander in chief. And apparently, it was our discovery for many, for politicians in Ukraine, that not even talking about our civilians, that commanders in chief are not for sale in uh, a store, in a supermarket. Even when you have a lot of money, you cannot buy one. You need to grow one, and it usually takes about 25, 30 years to grow a good one. And far from everyone can even become. Out of a hundred officers who finish their training, only seven graduate from academy, from the higher level, and only three of them become brigade commanders. And what is a brigade commander versus commander-in-chief, right? Something down there. Imagine how many of those you need to grow commanders-in-chief, especially commanders-in-chief in a huge continental war. So this is the main reason for the slowdown um, of Zaluzhny's uh, firing. The search for a right figure, not the uh, Abdivka or anything else on the front. Alexei, I heard that Sirsky and Budanov actually refused from this position. Uh, is that true? We don't know for sure. This, these are all <laughs> rumors and telegram channels. Um, you can bring them up, but I wouldn't analyze them with any seriousness. Okay, then I will ask another question. What I said about the lack of UAVs, drones, and artillery shells. That would be in the hands of politicians, right? Do you think they could have done something, anything, to acquire more of those artillery shells of the higher calibers and uh, to get more drones for the front lines? And I understand that Americans may have their own problems supplying these weapons, but perhaps political bloc of Ukraine could have done something to alleviate this issue. This is a very difficult and a complex question. I think that politics that were conducted during the war, even with all those painful issues that Ukrainian society has, could have been more effective, even without any big principal decisions. We can talk about changing the paradigm and all. Our whole government didn't quite succeed over the last 32 years because we're currently failing that exam by war and this is the main exam any country can take. I think even during the last year a lot of things could have been done, but unfortunately they were not. What is the share of subjective versus objective reasons? I think there are more subjective reasons. All right, let's uh, talk about objective reasons then. What uh, you think can happen after Avdivka? Apologies for me sort of writing it off, but we did talk for months that with this configuration the front will likely not hold. And uh, it is not too big of a grievance to leave a part of the front when you have long-term second line entrenchments prepared behind it. We don't know how well those uh, are built. We'll discover, I guess, in lieu of uh, fighting that will ensue. But I have a question why these um, Surovikian lines on the Ukrainian side are being built with the forces, with army forces, when they got money only at the end of December, when Zaluzhny was uh, creating a big ruckus at the Zelensky's command that they need equipment, they need money to build that. Where's uh, all that equipment? How well is the production going, construction? Let me object here. Zaluzhny did not uh, raise a fuss, he is a commander-in-chief, he informs or reports, he does not uh, create scandals. As for Suravikin line on our front, um, which generally is uh, about 2,000 kilometers long, it is being built by different forces in different parts, and different organizations are building it. I'm not sure which one is building it near Avdiivka, but as you said, the fighting will show. Um, one needs to understand that Avdivka itself was a very serious fortification that was being built since 2014, continuously. And as for the time that they had to build next-line entrenchments, that's a big uh, question, how well did they build them? 
we'll see when the battles get there we'll see what we have i'm personally very skeptical once again i'm not tired to repeating that whoever is building it all right so my question was should have it been built earlier and perhaps use the forces and equipment that are used for building um, those stadiums and other things uh, from the civilians targets Sure, yeah, we discussed that many times, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. We should have been starting way, way before, and this was one of the major strategic mistakes. Right, that was one of the decisions that Zaluzhny insisted upon. Uh, probably, I do not know for sure. Another question that we talked about just two days ago, one of the banes of Ukrainian Front, our refusers, and you cannot do anything with them because the war is officially uh, not a war. It was not declared as a war. In Russia, they have also the guys who refuse to fight, but they, them they put in pits. Uh, they use a uh, kind of torture on them and they use um, special troops that would shoot them if they leave their positions. So people can criticize Russia for not calling this operation a war, but Ukraine also did not declare a war, right? And I understand there are some diplomatic pluses and minuses in that and um, let's look at the minuses now what uh, that causes in line of refusers and what can be done well you know you know after 1945 there was only one war declared in the world why because united nations as the key institute of potsdam yalta agreements was uh, built in particular as well to prevent big war conflicts big military conflicts and there was international set of documents prepared there so they prevented all the wars you mean uh, sorry for interrupting you well let me finish this so they established the primacy of international law over their national laws and the formulation was that any country that declares war becomes an aggressor automatically even if or guilty automatically even if this declaration is done as an answer to an aggression and will be left without any international aid. So for Ukraine now to declare war would mean a very strong legal chance uh, to stay without any military support from other countries. And uh, for Putin it would uh, mean also harsher sanctions, so none of us have declared war, neither of the sides. And Unfortunately, that creates a difficult situation with refusers on the front. And when the war is declared, then we have more tools to work with refusers, but unfortunately our military justice system is generally broken, and back a few years ago we adopted uh, several legal acts that disallowed commanders to use their arms in relation to refusers and they supposedly increased the control over implementation of orders but it was done in a very democratic so to say way that leads to us uh, having up to 600 refusers standing in line in the nearby clinic uh, not far from the front trying to uh, get through the medical commission and justice department military branch of it is also cluttered and is very slow because they first need those uh, refusers to go through medical commissions, uh, through medical commission, which are slow. They use civilian doctors in those. They work usually for half a day only, and it's somewhere in the vicinity of the front, so the human resources usually scar scarce. When I was in the office, we tried to escalate this issue. I was participating in the research of how to deal with it, but after I uh, left the office, it seems nothing changed really, and. That's where we are right now. So you said a very interesting thing right now that I want to ask again. Do I understand right that if to calculate by inner reports in the United Nations, they have prevented all the wars except one, right? By the way, who are those people that were brave enough to declare that war? As far as I remember, that was the football war, a soccer war in um, Latin America. but. We're not Wikipedia, you guys can go, those who are listening, and check which one was it. But as for United Nations, they indeed, they uh, probably proudly reported on that, and I, I'm suspecting they got some 
bonus payments for that. Do you think there is a way to compensate for that lack of reality? So, same, for example, USSR and Japan were actually expelled from the League of Nations, one for Mongolia and Inner uh, China, the other for aggression against Finland. So, it seems like the League of Nations was actually counting by actual heads, while the current United Nations are counting by bureaucratic paperwork. Well, that's probably a question to those who were founding that organization. But today, President of Poland, Donald Tusk, said a remarkable thing. He said that, and turning to Americans, he said that Reagan is turning in his coffin looking at your current politics and at your behavior in this conflict. I can only join him in these words, and I said that before. Yeah, but that's about Americans, right, Alexei? About which country is the key country to solve this conflict? Who is the key donor? of the United Nations, who is giving more money to United Nations, who hosts the UN, by the way, and who exerts a defining pressure on the United Nations. Well, of course, there is uh, maybe France and Great Britain. We could ask them how they are doing with this. Um, how's, uh, how's life, right, in this regard? Alexei, I'm afraid it's not how it works. And the problem is that in the United Nations, there are a lot of small countries. And these small countries are very often um, shithole countries, like ex-President Trump called them, and they vote accordingly. And that idea that if you bring a lot of trash to any international organization, then this trash starts to vote in the same fashion as a collective farm was voting in the Soviet Union, as the voter of a very low quality, very low grade would vote. Kirsan Alumzhinov, the president of chess, International Chess Association, um, was uh, figured that out first when he brought a lot of countries that were not too proficient or enthusiastic about chess, but he brought them into this council and remained a lifelong leader as, a, as an effect of that. So I suspect that United Nations is a problem of the voting that is given to every little country in this organization. Well, let's ask a different question. Um, if United States and all this West have indeed had any strategy and really wanted to, do you think they could have um, negotiated that group of small countries or a certain group of small countries? I'll give you an example. There is a Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russian Federation, Sergei Lavrov. In March of 22, many African countries condemned Russian aggression against Ukraine. Then there were several summits and his visits, and 18 of those countries stopped condemning Russia or stopped voting for any resolution that uh, would be attacking or impactful to Russian Federation in the United Nations. And it was just Lavrov visiting them. So a question, if Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs managed that feat, do you think the West collectively could have changed the opinion of 18 countries, maybe a little more? Well, you know, it depends, I guess, uh, if they really want to deal with those. You guys have idealized views on Americans. I remember from the history that son of a bitch can be our son of a bitch and then he's good, right? If I was, uh, well, imagine that I'm the leader of the United States, in how many days do you think small countries would be voting the way we want them to? Um, I might say a scary thing here, but I think, Alexei, that the problem of uh, small countries that are irresponsible and a uh, matter of large questions, um, perhaps that's the cause. Because in League of Nations, these small countries did not have their voice, and bigger players were in. No, Yulia, I think the problem is that the West has run out, and maybe there are a percent or half percent chance that the West will recover. I do not believe that the West at large will be reborn in the way they were before, and um, perhaps the United States can. But it's a good question, what will the United States be reborn as? Now, everybody is attacking the United States for their politics and their ineffectiveness. 
in the last few months. There, there were over 100 attacks, 300, I think, total attacks of all kinds on their military bases, and only when they lost people, they started responding somehow. Um, there were two aircraft carriers that uh, were in the waters near Israel after a Hezbollah attack. They were supposed to help, but they were just hanging out there. And then Ukraine running out of shells, and nobody can supply us any support on this regard. Second time during this war, and now if there is a third conflict flaring up anywhere, I can only imagine where United States and the West will be. Um, this is the main problem, I think. The rest is just a consequence. Global South is raising their heads because they stop being afraid of the West. They know that nothing will happen to them if they attack American vessels or American bases. Or if they'll be punished, it'll be a small degree of punishment. They can survive that and they can also retaliate after. And that's kind of the general perspective what they have in China, the foreign political concept that was announced in 17 and uh, declared as the course by their politicians in 2019. The West is falling, the East is rising, and everything seems to fall suit. So about the West being becoming lazy, with which I agree with you. No, Yulia, they're not lazy. Let's be more precise here. I think they're out. They ran out. It, it's no more. Well, I wish we ended like that. No, I don't think so. I think they're out. What, they have good coffee? We have good coffee in Ukraine, too. What else is there? Elon Musk? Okay, Elon Musk is also an attacked figure in the West. And he also takes an interesting position, rather complementary position in the conflict with the uh, axis of evil, right? Conversing with Putin on the phone, discussing that the West and Ukraine are behaving themselves wrong. So almost Tucker. And maybe in a couple of days we can expect Musk yeah, sooner or later to come out and say that Putin is a strong political figure and a smart president, right? Um, that can happen. And when you keep watching all these chemical castrations they do with the kids in the West, when they allow kids to choose if they're a boy or a girl, yeah, after that you might uh, go and join Putin. And at the same time, Musk is saying the right things about family and all, but what's his name, what's his uh, child's name? H23, or whatever that joke name was, right? And uh, if it's a boy or a girl, there are issues even uh, on the, in the Musk's family. So he's a specific figure. Very mixed set of uh, ideas in this bag. Well, then perhaps let's think about why Musk is uh, such a mixed figure, a person who is aimed at uh, humanity flying to other planets and establishing outposts there. And do you think he understands that he cannot work well with the West if the West is retiring? So perhaps he is also starting to evaluate if he can work with other countries like Putin's, Russia and the others. And that law, that bill that was uh, keep mixing, it, whether they failed it in Congress or in Senate for support of Ukraine, and now there is a big chance that uh, support for Ukraine will be seriously delayed now. And one can explain that there are a lot of issues in the United States, they have migration problem that Trump wants to hurt Biden. But the, mo the main thing is that aid to Ukraine stopped being a political card that could be used by parties in these oncoming elections. That, hey, look, we are supporting Ukraine. Or is it a result of uh, something bigger in the United States or a result of bad uh, Ukrainian politics? Because two years ago, all parliaments of the world were applauding Zelensky. And one can, of course, write it off on the West and say they're so bad. But they're working for their own elections. They have very short planning horizon and they understand what brings scores, what doesn't. Why support of Ukraine does not bring score anymore? And is it related to position of forces in Ukraine, to Ukrainian political powers, or it's just the Western internal thing or mistakes that done by Ukraine? It's neither one nor the other, Yulia. 
It's processes happening in the United States that are the main reason, first of all. It's uh, also um, dual face of the Biden administration, because with one face they're telling their people that we're supporting Ukraine with everything we can, everything the best, and everything America has, and we're supporting this uh, budding democracy, and we will win. But in reality, their words uh, were matching with their material supplies maybe by 20%. They were giving us only 20% of what was needed. And they were only materially supporting it by 20% of resources to what they were declaring publicly. When the war was going on, they did not even give us a third of what we were asking for counteroffensive. And they pumped the expectations of their people rather high. And Biden found himself in a trap. He was again reminded of ineffective investments in military conflicts that were in Iraq and in Afghanistan, that uh, horrible withdrawal that uh, they recently experienced from Afghanistan. So his political opponents grasped on that. And since his family was uh, and, uh, supported by facts and uh, also promoted by uh, Republicans, that Biden family was already entangled in corruption scandals in Ukraine. And the main narrative in the United States is that Biden is spending money in Ukraine very ineffectively for American citizens, but very effectively for his own family. This is Republican logic. Do they think it for real? Yes, they do, uh, I'll say. And do they use it as a weapon on the internal elections? Yes, uh, they of course do. So Ukraine could have been a gem and a perfect player. But first of all, we did not have enough resources to fulfill the tasks that we were facing, that we were putting in front of us, and that the West was uh, pushing us to solve. And now when we are talking about even holding the front line and holding the current map, we are not given any support. Of course, uh, there is a factor we're being called a corrupt state run by ineffective politicians. But this, again, maybe has one third of a weight than uh, corruption within the Biden administration. So three would fall as a guilt on their scale and one on ours because we are what we are. So it would be very wrong to judge Ukraine and to put all the blame on Ukraine. $4.2 billion, according to Andrei Ilarionov still is left within presidential drawdown authority. Um, according to Ilarionov, that's what Biden can still spend to support Ukraine. I did not check his math, but what do maybe you hear? What do your American friends say? But I have a feeling that Biden, if he sees that the situation is so dire in Avdiivka that they really are out of shells, They've been using the reserves for the second month, and one can understand the situation is absolutely critical. I don't believe he has nothing for real to send to Ukraine. So $4.2 billion, and it's such um, an impression that it's easier for Biden to just say that Republicans uh, are guilty because of his inner politics. American president, despite of his last name, has a lot of levers and a lot of mechanism that he can use. Um, he can circumvent Congress and he can send a lot of military equipment right now that uh, are in service of American army. One of these programs is called Land Lease that uh, ended without supplying a single bullet to Ukraine that can be restored now as an opportunity and supply the whole American army if you want to, to Ukraine. He's not doing that. Uh, probably because it is more, he sees more advantageous for himself that, look, Republicans, you destroyed Ukraine because you did not vote, and it's not me who destroyed Afghanistan and uh, forced us to withdraw, it were you damned isolationists. And he will just write off Ukraine to get strong arguments to counter very strong arguments that Republicans have. This is what politics are, this is what American politics is. And when our propagandists who really want to join EU and NATO are telling us that 
America is a shining city on the hill, and they're sleeping and seeing how it cares for Ukraine. I'm being surprised uh, not by who is saying that. There are political cynics who try to write this uh, chant into paradise. I'm surprised that somebody still believes them. Because if you look at the actual facts, um, that tells you a whole different story. And yet there would still be people in the commentary under the stream who will be saying that you don't understand anything about the West. The West will awaken one day and will show how it should be done. Yeah, I think the time of cunning strategies has passed, especially in big politics. But you did touch upon the word land lease. And uh, there were a lot of people including Andrei Larionov, who were talking about that program early on. And I was very skeptical about that back in the day, and uh, I thought it's just a means to supply things to Ukraine, and if he wants, he can use land lease, or he can use uh, PDA, Presidential Drawdown Authority, or any other way he can use. But uh, land lease program ran out in autumn of 23, and after that was over, I started hearing rumors that it was Ukraine that did not insist on land lease. And to me, it seems pretty wild and far-fetched to accuse Ukraine of that. You were there in those times. What was there, what wasn't, perhaps? Can you dispel some? Yeah, we have to work in a corridor between different groups of uh, players. There are people on the one side, like Poroshenko, who is saying that uh, they are very happy to get inside Euro Union and uh, NATO because it is a shining dream of everyday Ukrainian, something like that. And then on the other side of the corridor, there is a, a group like Ilarionov and Lubarsky, so proverbial Scylla and Charybdis. And these guys are saying that the, the fellows like Romanenko and Arestovich, they were saying that America should not be supplying any aid with land lease, and Biden was ready to to sign that aid into action, and then he gets a message that Aristovich said something that he shouldn't, and then he basically desperately throws the pen away, because these two figures are telling us not to, and Ukraine is not insisting on using land lease, we will not. So these people are saying from that angle, and what can I say? If we believe in this, if we seriously review both hypotheses, it's not for this discussion. I can only approach it from critical realism to the first and to the second. My answer, if you want an independent answer, would sound like this. Biden had, and still has, as long as he's a president of the United States, a chance to supply military aid to Ukraine, pretty much everything that he has access to and he can transfer the whole American army here if he wants to. He's not doing that very consciously. If he wanted to, then uh, under that land lease program, we would have gotten 12 aircraft carriers, 500,000 missiles, and 200 F-35s. But not a single bullet was sent. And uh, even though he signed this uh, law, this uh, program, into existence on the day of victory, 9th of May, I think, uh, it just ran out. Well, Republicans were the authors of that, right? Maybe that's what the cause. Uh, but he signed it, he did not have to. It was proposed by a senator uh, with Ukrainian roots, who was um, attacked later in Ukraine and who is not welcome in Ukraine anymore, Victoria Spartz is her name. She was the only Republican who was in the cabinet when Biden was signing this program, but uh, it did not work. It was not used. All right, so you're saying two important things here that on one hand, Republicans are running around telling stories that Biden somehow is making millions in Ukraine, which I think is not true and a fantasy. On the other hand, well, Alexei, I think he can make money by other means. Well, okay. You know, I yeah, didn't stand with a candle over Biden family, but let's use a formula that says we do not know. Because if you discover later that he indeed profited from this, um, let's use the real one. We don't know. 
Well, I would say if in Ukraine they manage to make some money, how much money can they make in other places? Well, remember there was a program, oil in exchange for food, right? Iraq had it back in the day. Oh, I remember another one. This is an international program. I remembered one when you were talking, a very great letter by Plinium the Younger, where he tells the story about one Roman council who said, uh, hooray, I sold part of uh, our territory and I got some money. And that's how Rome was managing their provinces. Well, you know, it's only Texas who can steal in Texas. Well, so international program, oil in exchange for food. There were different things back then, and uh, people are saying that the son of the UN president at that time, his uh, personal income has disproportionately growth during those uh, years of that program, when this program started. And not only him. It's uh, up to historians to dig it up and figure it out, and who will put them in jail, their monumental figures, right? Well, no, I think that you may be right here, because there is a UNRA um, organization that supports Palestine, that was involved in that. And then there is Gutierrez, who is uh, being surprised how come the funding is uh, opposed to this organization. And when he has shown that here, where they dropped the card of an employee they picked uh, of, the, of that organization, they picked a machine gun and they pointed that at the hostage. So that in reality, Gutierrez and the head of that organization, they're basically two biggest uh, terrorist financiers in history. Bin Laden was not even in the same group. He could not have processed almost $2 billion a year, and these two were doing that in the plain daylight. Right, Yulia? That's why I prefer formulations we don't know in regards to Biden's profits. All right, we don't know what Republicans are accusing Biden's administration in, so we can wait and see what uh, transpires. Um, there is also Biden's side that accuses Republicans that it's on their hands, the blood of Ukrainians, because they're not voting for his packages. And I want to draw a bridge here to a fantastic stream we had with Grigory Yudin last week, a very distinguished Russian politologist, sociologist. Yeah, he's a talented fella. And we talked with him what we discuss with you as well about democracy. And we talked about very sad things. And he said that elections is not a whole core of democracy. And very often elections lead to the dictatorship of plebiscite. And that it is a big mistake to make democracy mean elections. And since that is what's happening in many countries of the world, not uh, only in Russia, where, according to their elections, Putin continues to win for 20 years already. And he did point towards Biden and Trump and the deficiencies of the system in case of both, both American presidents. And he basically outlined that in the trend, in the line of these new trends evolving in the world, he is actually at the forefront of exploiting these weaknesses of democratic structure. So what you're describing, that uh, Biden is using Ukraine as a tool to attack Republicans, that's a very characteristic example that something like Putin would do as well. And Putin is generally leading them in that direction. Allow me a couple of quotes. One is uh, mythological, another of unknown origin. So the first of an unknown author, probably a people's democracy is not a power of people, it's the power of Democrats. These are two very different things, right? And the second quote, according to the myth, belongs to Stalin, who said about democracy as follows. It probably is a myth, I don't know if he said that. We'll ask the fans of Stalin to figure it out.
He said, I think democracy is the power of people. But Comrade Roosevelt explained to me that democracy is the power of American people. I think this is an apocryphal quote that was probably born in the belly of KGB somewhere in the 80s, but there is definitely something behind it. Well, look, there is a lecture by Andrei Burmistr, who I like, um, about how PR and propaganda were established in the West. In the 20s, there was a serious discussion there on the backdrop of Great Depression and all, and two opposing points were something like this. One said that people need to be educated and elevated, so they would know the best things for themselves and how to govern themselves. The other point of view was that, no, the people are too dumb and too dull, so we don't have time to wait to teach them all that. Otherwise, we're giving children too strong of mechanisms to run economy and politics. So we just need to keep deceiving them for their better good. And um, that was actually 1910s. Um, and then there was also an example of a PR campaign that was done by an order of uh, President Wilson. And that was supposed to push Americans to go join and volunteer to fight for war in Europe. And in 17th, American Corps landed in France and started uh, decimating Germans. So in that campaign, they presented Germans as horrible monsters who wanted to bayonet every child in Europe, fry them and eat them alive. So, and that led to Americans uh, en masse volunteered for that war to aid and to protect uh, civilians of Europe from Germans. And then this campaign took such a steam that Wilson, at the signing of uh, Versailles treaties, uh, Versailles agreements, basically bestowed all culpability for the First World War on Germany, this, despite the fact that it was five uh, empires that started it. And uh, then we had the Second World War and Hitler and all the consequences. Um, so, Eugen, I would say, is a great person, great specialist. I have not read his works myself, but I trust the figures that are praising him. Ask him next time, when he is on your stream, if there is a non-plebiscite democracy. Or, let me clarify that, is there a non-controlled democracy, a democracy that is not controlled by anything, where it has uh, natural forces brooding within itself, and it's a natural gameplay of forces within. I can, uh, let me quote one more people's thing today. Uh, one American dad is saying, I taught children a democracy, I offered them to choose a movie and uh, choose a pizza that they would like. And then I put the movie that I'm watching and ordered the pizza that I like, because I have money. I have to say that that money indeed play a serious role, but democratic politician um, doesn't necessarily have his own money. He is using money of other people. But with his growth as a political figure, he is getting access to bigger and bigger purse, and then social networks jump on the bandwagon. And we find that democracy in the 50s was working the way that you're describing, with father and kids. And now we have a different democracy that functions in a different framework, because there are also bureaucrats who is listening very attentively to all the wishes of the kids, gives them the pizza and the movie that they want, and also penalizes the father and takes his parenting rights away and takes his money from dad to make sure that he can still feed pizza to the children, the one they want. And as a result, the dad is without money, and kids are essentially running the wishes and likes of the country. So that um, is a slightly different conundrum in this case. But that's what I think is the main problem. Yeah, great, Yulia. And uh, certain forward-looking people, like uh, Vladimir Putin in this case, uh, using it satirically, they understand how that works, and they're exploiting it to the umpteenth degree. And by the way, indeed, it reflects the wishes of a lot of people within Russia. He's not even deceiving them much. To his honor, he actually is not lying that much. Western democracies are often lying a lot more than he does.
That's why the punishment is usually worse. No, 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 what do you mean? He found those Nazis in Ukraine and Mariupol that Ukrainians bombed, according to Putin themselves. Well, that's war propaganda, Yulia. But where did they find the uh, evil person in, where was it, Libya? Uh, Gaddafi, who was killing his own people, right? Western democracies attacked him. He was an evildoer, right? He was drawing a third path for his country. How much was the price of a vehicle under him? How much young family got federal support when they wed? So much money that they actually could afford to study in different countries of the world, in different universities. But the moment when he invented a golden dinar, that's when he became uh, a golden currency, essentially. That's when he became a serious threat to Europe. And Berlusconi was, uh, from shaking his hands, went to attacking him. Alexei, I don't know, I don't agree with you about Gaddafi. This is the fellow who arrested Bulgarian nurses because his hospitals were poorly run and then forced them to acknowledge that they were hired by Israel government to propagate AIDS among the children of uh, Libya. And he used that to f push uh, Western leaders to talk to him. So he was uh, quite a cannibal leader, if you want to talk about him. Well, you know, I can bring another example. Mother Teresa, what she was doing, right? And then she was made a saint uh, after all. Oh, yeah. Mother Teresa is a whole other topic, and I think that many of our listeners do not know the core of the problem. This is a horrible story, actually. Oh, no, they can read it in Wikipedia, if they are curious. So, if we are starting a body count of who is culpable, we may find that the West will be just as culpable as the East. What does the West have on the advantages side? They still have some justice, more or less, that works. And in reality, a small person, a usual citizen, can stand for his rights in court, even fighting against big corporation or big figure in court. It will be difficult, expensive, but it's probable. And they do have uh, scientific advantages, right? But it seems like they're running out of these advantages rather soon. And the advantage of vitality so far is still on the side of the Global South, because the West appears to be self-killing, self-suiciding itself. The biggest indicator, the best indicator for that is uh, slow birth, low birth uh, coefficients. And I'm the one who would be openly acknowledging advancements and achievements of the West whenever they exist. But if we start counting who killed whom more, let's remember, um, who was that? Colin Powell, the director of chiefs of staff, or what position was him? Showing chemical weapons in the United Nations that, look, this is Saddam's chemical scary weapon. And suddenly Iraq is missing 150,000 people after this war and uh, the weapons are never to be found. So, you know, history is an interesting thing. Alexei, I'll tell you this. On one hand, I understand what you're saying perfectly well because when I see how people get cancelled for saying something wrong at the wrong time, or right at the wrong time in the wrong audience, when I look at the whole transgender uh, athlete motion, that when you do not acknowledge the person that uh, a man can swim, a biological man can swim against biological women, then you become a transphobe, then I totally disagree with that because when we are expanding rights of minorities at an exchange of rights of supermajorities, and that changes the whole society and attacks the pillars of it, that uh, you're being accused of being transphobic and whatever. And I look, I'm looking at that with horror. It's similar to the cultural revolution of Mao in China, similar to the party cleansings in Soviet Union in the 30s. But as I remember, what uh, those motions uh, in Soviet Union ended with, right? They ended with uh, massive executions. And then I'm looking at Navalny and the other political figures in Russia who are being put in jail. And this is essentially fascism, what's happening in Russia. They're on a 
their life is hanging by a thread. In the West, at, the, at worst, you'll be fired from job, right? You'll be looking for a new job, a new position, you'll have to reinvent your life. But you'll not be thrown in jail like that, like Putin does in Russia. Um, when I was leaving Russia and thinking, okay, I might go to academia in the West, but then I thought better because, you know, with my attitude, I'd probably be expelled and uh, cancelled rather quickly from it. But, you know, there is a difference between being cancelled socially and being between being thrown in jail. It's a big difference. No, Yulia, I don't think that's a colossal difference. And there's only difference in some how the law is being used and any tradition, if uh, there remains any tradition in judicial system. In Russia, there, yeah, there is no tradition. Maybe there is a bloody tradition, if anything. Well, on the West, yeah, you get hired, you get fired from a job like Tucker, and then he found a new Tucker. He is taking interviews from Putin in Russia. Now, answer me this: Is there any president under investigation, under criminal investigation in Russia? Well, they are not allowed to. They put Navalny in jail. Well, they want to put Trump in jail, and he is, unlike Navalny, who is being not being supported by majority of Russians, Trump is being supported by a vast majority of Americans, or at least half of them. Yet he is still prosecuted, similar as Navalny was prosecuted, and they're attempting to put him behind bars in the same fashion that Navalny is behind bars. So the differences are dwindling. I'm far from defending Putin and his regime, trust me. I'm just showing that these things are shades of gray and definitely not black and white, especially given that in cultures, in the, especially in the Eastern side and Russian culture, human rights is a very remote concept. Do you know which two countries did not sign the Declaration of Human Rights? Alexei, first, I don't know, and second, I want to address um, our listeners to find the stream about the sect of protecting human rights, about how that whole rather leftist story was built, how somehow it coincided with the Communist International organization that was the first uh, organization in the United States, ACLU, that was founded by a true communist, by the way, who not only in his private communications but in public and program letters was saying that we'll walk under the false flag, we'll use the values of bourgeois society to destroy that society. And in his public statements, he was also writing that everything is okay in Soviet Union because their proletariat is already at the seat of power, so we don't need to break anything there and they don't need any freedom of speech anymore. And America did not uh, need human rights to liberate slaves, to win independence, but when the Communist International appeared, all of a sudden they were such a bad player on the human rights, right? So two countries did not sign human rights. First one was Vatican and second was Russian Federation. And Russian Federation did not do that, not because they're too smart or have some serious theology that they operated with, like Vatican, but they just failed because uh, it was the time of the failure of USSR and they were in turmoil and never did, and now they're still enjoying their position. So we get it about Russia, but what about Vatican? Why do you think they didn't? Well, they probably consider that Catholics do care about their souls differently, right? They they think that Declaration of Human Rights actually attacks human rights. It's a very primitive concept in comparison with Christian ontology, because in Christianity, a human is made in an image of God. And when we're drawing the picture that is drawn by Soviet humanism, it's a very direct attack on the human nature, because he is not a monkey that needs to be supervised. He is an image of God, and that's how Vatican sees it. That's why they never signed it. And uh, many churches are against human rights in this regard, in this way. And Soviet Union, of course, did not want to sign that because they, yeah, they had their own things. So here's the question. What the West is fighting for, if they're still fighting? To be continued in part two.